Hello everyone. This is SK Mehta, presently the president of the Indian Nuclear Society called INS. I wish to welcome you all to this INS series lectures. This series about uh, 13 lectures is aimed to acquaint you with the various aspects of the nuclear energy its utilization in various areas benefiting humanity, the limitations and the regulatory aspects in safety and protection. One of the main objectives of the INS is to promote the advancement of nuclear science and engineering and technology related to the atomic nucleus and the allied sciences and arts. With this objective, INS has been disseminating information through journals, books, reports, newsletters, seminars, and conferences. These have mainly been to keep the INS members and other scientific communities and organizations well informed about the development in the various areas of science and technology within India and world over. Or it is realized that there is a need to keep the various professionals, undergraduate students, and general public knowledgeable in their respective fields of nuclear science and engineering. For the benefit of, uh, of the public, some of the important and the common application of nuclear being for power, industrial use, medical diagnosis and treatment, agriculture, food preservation, and various other areas. This lecture series is made in simple language and illustration with the aim to inform the general viewer about the science, engineering, and technology, social benefits of the nuclear, application of nuclear carrier benefits in nuclear and regulatory and safety of the nuclear energy. The presentations are prepared and narrated by experts on each topic in a way that the viewers with no background knowledge about the nuclear science and engineering can understand. Our effort will be to constantly provide information about newer benefits to the society emerging out of the pain-taking research and nuclear science and engineers. Viewers are encouraged to comment, suggest, and put forward question to the experts. The channel of the constructive communication will always be open in INS, which is website ins-india.org. Welcome all to this wonderful lecture series by Indian Nuclear Society. There are 13 lectures on various topics related to nuclear energy and its application to societal benefits. All these lectures will cover different aspects of nuclear energy in sectors like power, medicine, agriculture and society. It illustrates in simple way the science behind nuclear reactors for all of us. Hello viewers, welcome and greetings to the Indian Nuclear Society's lecture series 2022. I am Anand from Health Physic Division of Baba Atomic Research Center and in this lecture I will be talking about environmental effects of nuclear power. The overview of this uh, lecture contains a brief introduction about the nuclear fuel cycle, nuclear power plants operating in India and their discharges and different pathways of exposure through which they deliver dose to the public. Also we will compare 
the exposure from various sources with this uh, nuclear power plant uh, releases and the environmental monitoring program in place. Also briefly we will talk about safety features of this uh, nuclear power plant which mitigate the dose to the public in case of accidental conditions. And again briefly we will uh, see how this nuclear energy is a clean energy which releases very low carbon footprint and greenhouse gases and hence less burden to the global climate. Finally, I will summarize some of the important salient features of this lecture. To briefly introduce about the nuclear fuel cycle, this nuclear fuel cycle consists of three parts, front end, service period and back end. The front end of the fuel cycle starts from mining, example uranium mining, then milling, conversion and of course if required the uranium-235 will be enriched. Otherwise the natural uranium can directly taken in the fuel fabrication plant and fuel pellets and fuel bundles will be prepared. And this part of the activity is called the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle. Then after the fuel manufacture, it is uh, taken into the nuclear reactor where they generate electricity due to nuclear fission reaction in the reactor. Now after radiation or generation of electricity, the fuels are called spin fuels which will be stored in the interim storage facility. This may be for few years. To reduce the heat generated by these uh, spin fuel bundles as well as to reduce the radioactivity content in this spin fuel. Later this fuel is taken to spin fuel reprocessing plant where these actinides are separated from the rest of the radioactive material and they will be again utilized back by recycling into this nuclear fuel cycle as a fuel. Then remaining part will go to that final disposition like geological repository. And there is also another option where the spin fuel will go directly into this final disposition. So this part is called that back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. India has adopted the closed nuclear fuel cycle. As you can see, uh, we process this spent fuel and the useful actinide material will be put back into the system for further utilization. The more details on this uh, nuclear fuel cycle, back end and front end, you can uh, listen from other uh, uh, lectures in this lecture series. Nuclear energy for uh, electricity production. In the previous slide, we had seen about the three parts of the nuclear fuel cycle, in which this middle is the service period where the nuclear fuel undergoes fission in the nuclear reactor to produce electricity. In India, there are 22 nuclear power reactors currently operating and producing 6780 megawatt electric of power. This is the total net capacity. And this electricity production through this uh, nuclear energy comprises 
roughly 3 to 4 percent of the total power produced in our country. And there are six nuclear power reactors are under construction presently and they will be adding an additional capacity of 4800 megawatt electric power to the nation. As we had seen, there are 22 nuclear reactors operating in India presently. Out of these 22, 18 are pressurized heavy water reactors at different locations in our country. Two boiling water reactors are at the Tarapur and two pressurized water reactors are at Kudankulam. This is the schematic diagram of a typical Indian pressurized heavy water reactor. Here this light blue color, this area is the reactor core which contains nuclear fuel, moderator and coolant. The fuel undergoes nuclear reaction, fission reaction and releases the energy which is carried by this coolant through the primary heat transport system and the heat energy is exchanged in the steam generator where the steam is produced and uh, which turns this steam turbine and generates electricity. So far we have seen about the uh, nuclear fuel cycle and the uh, nuclear power plants operating in India. Now in this particular slide, we will see how these nuclear waste are managed during the normal operation of these facilities. Um, similar to any other industrial facility, this nuclear facilities, whether it is a reactor or industrial or medical facility which handles the radioactive material, during the normal operation, that is operational state of their facility, they release waste in three major forms. They are uh, solid, liquid and gas. And how they are handled and disposed to the environment is briefly explained in this slide. So as we can see the vertical arrow which indicates the waste which comes out from this operational during the operational state of this facility may be concentrated and retained. And the horizontal arrow shows the waste. There is a methodology by which you can dilute its large amount of air or water and it can be dispersed to the environment. Now, again coming back to this concentrate and uh, retain concept, once you concentrate or retain, here for example concentrate in the sense, in the case of solid waste, you reduce the volume as much as possible. Retain, you retain the radioactive material in certain matrix, for example ion exchange column. And these concentrated or retained radioactive materials they can be disposed in the surface or underground. And the migration of the radionuclide or the waste may get released to the environment after very, very long time. So they are called delayed releases. Now, coming back 
again to this dilute and disperse concept where the waste is diluted with large amount of air or water and they generally released immediate which is called as early or immediate releases and these two forms of the waste are generally released using this concept dilute and disperse that is air and liquid to this environment again the more detailed uh, lecture on this topic you can find again in this series given by other lecture in the previous slide we have discussed about the nuclear waste management and in this present slide let us see what is meant by discharges and uh, different types of discharges from a nuclear facility a discharge is a planned and controlled release of gaseous aerosol and are uh, liquid radioactive substances to the environment in this uh, animation you can see that uh, the gases and uh, particulate material or waste material they are released through this stack after proper dilution into the atmosphere this is one mode of uh, discharge from the nuclear facility then also the liquid radioactive substances are released to the nearby river or lake or ocean after proper dilution and they get dispersed in the aquatic environment this is the second mode of uh, discharge and the solid waste material generated in this facility are uh, stored in uh, near surface disposal facility which may be later further undergoes treatment and disposal to a deep geological repositories now this uh, discharges into the environment from uh, authorized or regulated sources are properly controlled and they are optimized within the public dose constraints so this public dose constraint which is uh, shown pictorially here uh, are selected at some fraction of dose limit so this is a mainly a uh, source related uh, sub limit on which the discharges are uh, are discharges into the environment are derived now let us see what is meant by the dose limits for members of the public our national regulator atomic energy regulatory board has adopted the dose limits from the recommendations of international commission on radiological protection um, that is icrp which says that the estimated average doses to the relevant members of the public shall not exceed the following limits these limits have been set by the arb that is an effective whole body dose of 1 millisievert in a year and also it should not exceed an equivalent dose to the lens of the eye of 15 millisievert in a year and an equivalent dose to the skin of 50 millisievert in a year these limits are arrived based on uh, the large amount of scientific uh, literature and the recommendations from uh, icrp 
and here the picturely we can see what this dose limit means this limit is for the individual from all regulated sources under planned exposure situations so the normal exposure of individual resulting from all exposure or all relevant practices should be subject to this dose limits so far we have seen about uh, nuclear waste management and uh, discharges and what are the uh, dose limits to the public now let us see what are the potential exposure pathways exist through which the uh, emissions or discharges leads to uh, the public dose for example we have a nuclear facility and human being in the environment as we seen in the previous slides the atmospheric discharges may take place during normal operational state of the nuclear facility and these discharges are within the regulatory limits the atmospheric discharge contains a gaseous and particulate radionuclides the physical form is either it will be a gas like a noble gas or particulates and these gases and particulates in the form of a puff or plume get released into the environment through the stack the presence of radionuclide in the plume or cloud will lead to this plume sign dose due to the emission of long range gamma radiation emitted due to the decay of radionuclides in the environment the another pathway is inhalation dose when the person in the environment if he inhales the gas or particulate that will lead to the dose through inhalation exposure pathway also the airborne pollutants deposit on the ground either by dry deposition or by wet deposition that's mainly due to rain out otherwise we call it as precipitation they deposit on the ground which will be taken by the crops and uh, again eaten by the livestock animals which they ingest this uh, crop containing radionuclides and then it will enter through the food chain which human beings consume and they deliver this ingestion dose through food milk and crops also there is another pathway exist when these particulates they deposit on the ground again they may deliver external direct dose to the human being due to the emission of long range gamma ray gamma radiation now next let us see the another uh, discharge which we have already seen that is through the liquid route when the material discharged into the nearby water bodies they may enter through this drinking water pathway and they will deliver the ingestion dose or the run off to nearby surface water or which may again leach through ground water and again they will enter into this drinking water pathway 
also through marine or river environment the organisms accumulate the radionuclide and this radionuclide again will enter into the food chain through this aquatic food pathway so these are the potential exposure pathways exist and deliver those to the human being now we had seen the various exposure pathways uh, and also the discharges from the nuclear facilities so in practice um the agencies which operate the nuclear power plant also the independent organization which monitor the um radionuclides in the environment they estimate the dose to the public due to the releases as well as some measurements in the environment and they submit the report to the regulator so one such study is displayed in this slide so this is about the public dose due to environmental releases from typical reactors at a different places in the country for example this table and graph combined table and graph shows the result of estimate of public dose due to releases from the reactors at seven different sites across our country the name of the sites are tarapur ravatbata kalpakam narora kakrapara kaiha and kudankulam these are the seven site nuclear power plant site where the doses are estimated at different periods of time again you can see vertically from 2016 to 2020 also these results are pictorially shown as a bar graph here and you should remember that the value of these estimates are given in terms of micro sievert the doses are estimated at the site or exclusion boundary of each nuclear power plant site also you please note that the arv prescribed annual limit to the public is 1000 micro sievert from these releases this is uh, nothing but 1 millisievert both are equivalent both are equal now let us see the results in 2016 4.24 micro sievert is the dose estimated at the site or exclusion boundary at tarapur and 2017 the dose is slightly reduced to 3.41 then 18 it is 3.16 micro sievert 2019 it is 6.52 micro sievert and 2020 it is 1.57 micro sievert so these results shows that although it uh, reduce re, uh, decreases and increases but they are around 2 to 4 uh, micro sievert for this particular site similarly ravat bata site the values vary from 15 to 30 micro sievert over this 5 years again that similar uh, trend is observed at kalpakam site again around 15 to 30 micro sievert moving to other rest of the four site narora kakrapara kaiga and gudankulam you can see almost all the values are less than 1 micro sievert except these two 1.3 micro sievert kaiga 
at 2016 and 17. Otherwise, rest of the time at Narora, the value is around 0.3 to 0.5 micro sievert per year. Kakrapara again 0.2 to 0.5 micro sievert. Taiga, it's around 1 micro sievert. Kudankulam is much, much lesser than 1 micro sievert. It is again 1 tenth or 1 hundredth of micro sievert per year. So, this gives an idea that the discharges from the nuclear power plants the dose due to the discharges from the nuclear power plant are much, much lower than the prescribed annual limit by the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. This is another bar graph which compares average doses estimated at site boundary of each nuclear power plant site. Here we have compared the six uh, power plant site with the AERB limit and the value that we receive from uh, due to natural uh, radiation background. The values are uh, given in terms of uh, micro sievert per year. Here we can see the values varies from 1 micro sievert per year to 26 micro sievert per year due to the discharges from these power plants. The, there is a 10 times difference one can observe between uh, for example Narora and uh, MAPS, that is Madras Atomic Power Station, or RAPS, which is 26.37 micro sievert. The major uh, reason for this difference is that uh, they are having a different generation of pressurized heavy water reactor. Uh, RAPS and MAPS has the older generation of PSWR. There the Narora onwards uh, we have uh, um, a new generation of uh, PSWRs and uh, in the new generation of PSWRs this Argon 41 release is uh, almost eradicated. So the, that is why the doses are uh, 10 times or uh, 20 times less than the old generation of PSWRs. <laughs> While, uh, uh, the, however, the comparison with the AERB limit shows that they are 1000 or 100 times lesser than the limit set by the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. Also, while comparing to the natural background, the values are 2000 times lesser. So, the releases from the power plants that contribute to the total dose to the individual is very negligible. In the previous slide, we have compared the average annual exposure to an individual at the site boundary due to discharges from various power plant with the ARB limit. In this slide, we compare the same typical value at the site boundary of an operating a nuclear power plant with the various exposure from natural and artificial radiation. The typical one is the dental or chest x-ray. This is uh, due to the medical exposure condition. 
you can see the value is uh, ranging from 0 0.005 millisievert to 0 0.1 millisievert. So this is uh, 10 times or 100 times more than the typical dose received at the site boundary due to the discharges from the nuclear power plant. Also, we can see in this scale, the annual public dose is placed at this level, which is uh, 2.4 times lesser than the annual average dose from natural radiation background in India. Also, a typical chest CT scan um, delivers 7 millisievert of dose which is uh, three times higher than the average annual dose from natural radiation background. We knew that uh, occupational radiation workers uh, annual dose limit is 20 millisievert. However, uh, the person or astronauts working on uh, international space station, their limit is uh, almost seven and a half times higher, that is 150 millisievert. So this uh, picture gives a uh, perspective uh, where a uh, yeah, typical dose from living one year within a few kilometers of an operating nuclear plant in India uh, is placed with respect to all other uh, natural uh, exposure from natural and other artificial radiation sources. This is the another uh, pie chart that compares the uh, dose or exposure due to nuclear industry with all other sources. Here we can see 85% of the total dose is from the natural radiation. So what are the different components that contribute to this 85% uh, dose of total dose they are 42 percent is from the radon and its daughter products the radon is a noble gas <coughs> which is a daughter product of uh, the radium uh, in uranium series which uh, uh, becomes airborne after decay uh, from uh, its parent radium and this radon whenever we inhale along with its daughter products delivers the dose to an individual. So 42% of the total dose which we receive is from this radon and its daughter product. Then next is 18% from the buildings and soil. This we term it as again a terrestrial uh, source. That is the uranium, potassium and thorium which are present normally in the soil and the building in the terrestrial environment. They contribute the external dose to the individual. Then uh, next comes this cosmic radiation 14%. This is from the cosmic uh, radiation components are various uh, high energy deep particles uh, that uh, give dose um, to the, the human being that contributes to 14% of the total and then 11% is through food and drinking water that is this green this is due to the ingestion of uh, the radionucleates which are naturally present in the food and drinking water. Then remaining 15% is due to the artificial uh, radiation. Out of 15%, 14% we receive through the medicine which we have seen in the previous slide by taking a CT, by taking oral or dental x-rays or uh, taking a chest x-ray they contribute 14 percent of the total dose received by an individual in a year so the remaining one percent is from the 
uh, discharges due to the uh, dose received due to the discharges from the nuclear industry. Now, coming back to the public dose estimate due to environmental releases from the nuclear power plant. This graph describes what are the doses to the public at different downwind distances from the nuclear reactor site. The previous slide, similar kind of bar graph was there in which the doses were estimated at the site boundary exactly and we saw the variation across the different period that means different year from 2016 to 2020. In this slide we are talking about only 2020 estimate but at different different downwind distance from their source release source again there are seven uh, sites are considered tarapur ravatbata kalpakam narora kakrapara kaiga and kudankulam and at 1.6 kilometer of course that will be the highest uh, dose because that is due to the close proximity to the source release source so at tarapur at 1.6 kilometer 1.57 micro sievert is the dose to the public in 2020 this is an estimated dose between 1.6 to 5 kilometer range of distance the dose reduces to 0.73 micro sievert then 5 to 10 kilometer it is 0.32 10 to 15 kilometer it is 0.19 and at 15 to 30 kilometer the dose reduced to 0.12 micro sievert per year it reduces by an order of magnitude at large distance for example 30 kilometer one can see this similar trend at Ravad Bata from 15 micro sievert to it reduces to 0.54. Kalpakam 18 micro sievert reduces to 0.8 micro sievert at 30 km. Similarly, at Kudankulam at 1.6 km it is 0 0.01 micro sievert, which reduces to 0 0.001 micro sievert at 30 km distance. Here you can see from 5 to 30 km the dose is almost the same. That indicates that this is the mostly the background dose in that area. Again, please note that AIB prescribed dose limit is 1000 microsievert per year. And these estimated values are 100 at least 100 and uh, 1000 times lesser than this prescribed annual limit. So far we have seen the dose estimate, the dose to population at the fence boundary resulting from the existing nuclear power plants is about 1.5 percent maximum of the authorized dose limit of AER, which is a small fraction of the natural background radius. And also the doses at further distance are still lower. How these estimates are made already uh, briefly explained. Due to the environmental monitoring at each and every nuclear power plant site, and elaborate studies conducted by the professional leads to such precise estimation of these doses. 
at each of the nuclear power plant sites environmental survey laboratories they are called esls are established which are operated by an independent organization these esls have been collecting and analyzing radioactivity levels in the samples of various environmental matrices for example soil leaf vegetation then drinking water also the meat whatever available in this area like fish any other meat in the radius of 30 km from the plant site and they help in estimating these those estimates there is a very elaborate monitoring program exist in the country at various stages of importance it is not only during operation of the nuclear power plant for example pre operational stage before construction of these reactors it's termed as the pre operational stage environmental samples are collected meteorological data are collected and the baseline radiation levels and radioactivity levels are established then during the operational stage we had seen uh, various uh, examples in the previous slides so how they are monitored the discharges are monitored the environmental samples are collected and they help in estimating estimating the dose to the public and that will ensure whether the regulatory limit is crossed or not this monitoring during operation is carried out at both the source as well as in the environment also after the completion of the operational stage of these reactors they undergo decommissioning this happens after 40 50 or 60 years of operation later they undergo decommissioning or closure of this plant even during that stage elaborate programs of monitoring all the waste generated released into the environment and all as well as the environmental monitoring program is in place also the post closure that is returning back to the original condition there is a class which as far the environmental monitoring so this is a very detailed monitoring program in the nuclear industry from pre operational stage to the post closer stage of this nuclear power program as i mentioned in the previous slide that the monitoring during the normal operational state of the nuclear facility is at mainly at two places source as well as environment we knew that the environmental monitoring program is established to monitor the environment however at the source the safety aspects in the nuclear power plant is handled by the health physics units each nuclear power plant has a health physics unit which comprises of a group of trained and experienced radiation protection professional they implement the radiation protection program in the plant so they take care of all the occupational exposure and the protection the hpus in all npps in the country are entrusted with the responsibility of providing radiological surveillance and safety support functions these include monitoring of working areas the personal monitoring also the system process systems the effluent monitoring whatever the discharges we had discussed previously 
and also the exposure control and exposure investigations. So they get involved in all these areas of health physics and they provide radiological surveillance and safety support function during the operation as well as emergency condition. So far we had seen uh, discussed during the operational states of a nuclear facility. Now let us see what are the barriers or protection systems are available before the radioactivity gets released into the environment. The first barrier itself, physical barrier itself, is the fuel matrix which traps the radionuclides which are formed during the nuclear fission reaction. Then the second barrier is the cladding that immediately surrounds that fuel matrix. Then the third barrier is the primary circuit or uh, primary heat transport system that closed boundary provides the next barrier which prevents the release of radioactivity. Then there is a next level of protection that is even if there is a deviation from the normal operation, how do I prevent? So there are safety systems or protection systems available that prevents the deviation from the normal operation itself. Then there is a next level of protection system which controls the anticipated operational occurrences. The anticipated operational occurrence may happen once in lifetime of the reactor, but still how do we control using different engineers systems that is the second level of uh, protection says then the third level how do we control the accident in design basis itself how to take care of the accidents which are going to happen once in 10,000 years during the operation of the reactor. So how to take care in the design basis itself by providing engineered safety features in the reactors. Then the fourth physical barrier is the confinement or the containment we call the dome which people see uh, outside the reactor they are uh, doubly double containments are available and that is the fourth barrier which prevents the release of radioactivity to the environment then the fourth level of protection is the accident management including confinement protection this is also important it's not just allow uh, the accident to progress on itself but that management during the accident that uh, follows uh, a series series of uh, actions that protect the confinement and uh, mitigate the release to the environment then there is a fifth level of protection that is called as an off-site emergency response. Even at the very first case or beyond design basis accidents, which may occur once in uh, 10 to the power 6 or 10 to the power 7 years, even such kind of worst uh, severe accident happens. What is the emergency response? 
in the public domain and how do we handle it so they are very well documented practiced and the preparedness this is the fifth level of protection that is termed as offsite emergency as i have mentioned in the previous slide the emergency preparedness is the final uh, level of protection all the nuclear power plants have established and documented emergency procedures by having detailed on site as well as off site emergency preparedness plans it is not only the plans available in the document as well as the material and uh, uh, how do they communicate during the emergency and uh, the actions carried out by different agency they are very well documented and practiced the specific requirements with respect to emergency preparedness in nppps have been formulated by the atomic energy regulatory board in the various regulations so the preparedness and response to emergencies are important responsibilities of the operating organization that is the nuclear power plant operator the role responsibilities action plans for various agencies required to act during an emergencies are detailed in these plans as i so we are uh, almost at the end of this lecture and before i conclude i would briefly like to introduce this small topic and role of nuclear power plant in controlling global climate change because nuclear power is a clean and green energy source and let us see this um, graph bar graph in which the x axis you can see the different fuel which is used in the power plant For example coal gas biomass solar geothermal hydro nuclear and wind so there are eight different sources are compared in this graph and in the y axis is a carbon dioxide emission in terms of gram per kilowatt hour i will tell what are the two different colors of this uh, bar the blue one indicates the direct green uh, sorry the blue one indicates full life cycle emission that means it uh, is not only restricted to the direct emission it includes due to the transport of the coal from the mine to the power plant which also include certain emission of carbon dioxide right whereas the red one indicates the direct greenhouse gas emission from the power plant or the power production during the power production so it is a lesser than the blue one right so we can see out of all these eight different sources coal has the maximum emission of course due to the presence of carbon in the coal then 50% or less than that is the contribution from gas power plants where the 490 is due to the full life cycle emission whereas 370 gram per kilowatt hour is from the direct greenhouse gas emission then the biomass is again uh, uh, one fourth of the coal also higher it is 230 but of course it doesn't have anything uh, direct here and the solar cell as we see zero that means there is no direct greenhouse gas emission 
due to the production of electricity from the solar panels. However, due to the manufacturing process of all these component and material, that leads to roughly 41 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour. Similarly, geothermal, the direct emission is zero, but there are some components will be manufactured to produce the electricity that accounts for certain amount that is 38 in that scale. Similarly, hydro zero emission, direct zero emission, however 27, which is due to the construction of different components. The next to is next to this hydro is nuclear, where again the emission of CO2 is zero from the direct emission point of view. However, there are some components, transport of uh, material, they all contribute to roughly an value of 12 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour. The wind is the least, which is having a zero direct, there is no emission of CO2, direct emission of CO2. However, again, due to various component manufacture to erect these windmills and maintaining all these things to account, that the value turns around to be 11 gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. So this comparative graph shows that NPPs produce virtually no greenhouse gas emissions or air pollutant during their operation and comparatively very low emission over their entire fuel cycle also. So nuclear power can make an important contribution to reducing GHG emissions while delivering energy in the increasingly large quantities needed for global economic development. So we have come to the final part of this lecture. So far uh, from the beginning we had seen uh, how the nuclear waste are managed, what are the discharges and what is the public dose limit during planned exposure situations. Also how much is the public dose at the site boundary how they are estimated, what are the various exposure pathways and then we have compared the um, these estimates with the various sources, natural and artificial radiation sources. Also we had seen about the environmental monitoring program in place to monitor the environment as well as uh, at the source level. Then we saw that uh, what are the emergency uh, management practices uh, during uh, any mall operating or accidental conditions. So in addition to this, to summarize, India's safety record has been excellent in uh, operation of power reactors since 1969. All the nuclear facilities are cited designed, constructed, commissioned and operated in accordance with strict quality and safety standards. Safety of workers, public and the environment is ensured at every stage by imposing stringent regulatory guidelines. That is from pre-operational stage to post-closure stage. The independent surveillance program clearly shows that the protection measures are adequate to ensure that the use of ionizing radiation and nuclear energy in India does not cause undue risk to health and environment. Thank you for the kind attention. I acknowledge my colleagues, Ms. Ria Day and Mr. Jan Krishan in shaping up this uh, lecture. Thank you once again. So, I hope you all 
enjoy this lecture. Do not miss other lectures from Indian Nuclear Society. If you have any questions, please write to us on this 